So what I want everyone to do is, first of all, check the sound on your cell phone and make sure that it is off, okay? And then I want cell phones face down, okay? Because I am giving you my time, and in my classroom we call it professional courtesy, you know? The way we honor other people's hard work and their presentations is by paying attention. So please make sure your cell phone is put away, out of sight. If you don't have any place to put it that's safe, if you don't have a bag, then put it face down. All right? And keep it that way. All right. Uh, so I'm Ms. Nolan. I've been teaching AP Lines for a while, and I really love it. And I love synthesis. You know, synthesis is useful. And it's the most important skill, probably, that you will learn. And you will use it for the rest of your life more than any other. And this does, it doesn't matter what field you go into. And you already do a lot of synthesis because when you get ready to form an opinion about something, when you need to find out about something, what do you do? You do research, right? Usually you get your phone out, you start looking things up, yeah? Do you just go to one source? Do you just read, if you're getting ready to purchase something, a big technological purchase, a new phone, or a some kind of gaming system that you just read one review and think, yeah, that's it, I'll go with that. That's a big purchase. You're going to look at more than one, aren't you? And from all of the different opinions that you find out there, you're going to decide what to purchase, right? You're going to make your own decision. That's what synthesis is. So I'm a big believer in mnemonics. I have a bad memory sometimes. So I have to jog my memory. So this is what I want you to think about synthesis. Synthesis is, okay, and is equals idea plus supports. Synthesis is using textual evidence from other works to support and prove your thesis. Yes? This is very true, okay? Um, so I want you to tell me what textual evidence is. What's textual evidence? What? Stuff from the tax. That's right. Okay. So I want you to think for a minute about all of the ideas that have been launched from others. You know, what if there were no internet? What if there were no libraries? What if there were no books? And any time you wanted to do something, you had to start from scratch. We'd be in bad shape, wouldn't we? So we all launch new ideas off of the old ideas of other people, right? Okay. So I've got... Uh, a little video for you because I started thinking about this like what can they really think about this grown that's launched and I remember a student teacher that I had once and she had this cool little device back before anybody carried around a cell phone and it was called well I think we did have like cell phones like flip phones that kind of thing she had a palm pilot and it was the coolest thing because her palm pilot had her calendar on it so she could look at it and see where she was supposed to be and I remember thinking oh that's really cool because my phone was just a phone but now what is your phone computer. it's a computer with a phone app right that's basically what it is so let's think about how we got there I'm hoping this will work it looks like it will maybe Here we go. All right. I don't know if we'll have sound. We don't really have to have sound. Okay. All right. So watch. So some cell phones through the ages. These cell phones, they're crazy looking. They really did look like that. I don't find any sound here, but okay. So look at these phones anyway. What do you think about them? That really was a cell phone. Does that look like anything you've ever seen before? Walkie talkie. This guy, I wish you could hear it, but this guy is um, 
his cell phone is telling him things to do, and at first he loves it, and then he gets aggravated with him. So, oh, the Motorola. He's telling him how many calories are in his uh, in his burger. Finding him out there. So, as they're working on these cell phones and coming up with new and better ones, what do you, what do you think they're doing? Are they just starting over every time? Okay. They're going, they're going from the most recent cell phone, yes? And working and adding on. Do you know what year the first cell, the first iPhone came out, the first smartphone? It's coming. You're about to see the first one. Just the shapes are strange enough, aren't they? I wonder what kind of research they did to figure out what was the best shape. I remember the sideways ones that where you texted and it was sideways. Oh, here, they're starting to look a little. Look, look. Here it comes. Oh, dramatic pause. It's really aggravating that at him now. So the evolution of the phone is, is not so great sometimes because he eventually tells him he looks really stupid when he's angry and he says, look, I took a picture. That doesn't end. Oh, the stylus. That was a thing. The glory of Do you think it's there yet? No. The first ones came out in like 2007, 2008, 2009. And of course, they've come such a, a long way, haven't they? We don't even know how far they've come, okay? Um, you know, I mean, all of those things, what are we even going to have? Um... I, I sort of think that eventually we'll get back to a Palm Pilot of sorts where we have, um, we can look at our hand and our cell phone will be like, you know, our palm. Of course, that's not really fair because you have a big hand, you'll have a bigger screen, right? Uh, my, old, my, my daughter has a dog and she... She's, uh, she's on her own. She pays for her own things now. She's a grown person. But her dog has a, a GPS in its body, like under its fur. And she can track her dog and see where he is in the house or in the yard or whatever. So technology's come a long way. And it all builds from each other, doesn't it? So if you get an idea for something new and technological, you're not going to start from ground zero. You're going to find out what's been done. Okay, and that's what synthesis is. So what is it like on the test? That's what you're here to find out today, all right? It's the first question. It's always the first question. And technically, you get 15 minutes to read and 40 minutes to write. Now, in the old days, they used to say, okay, your reading time starts now. You may not write until the end of the reading time. They don't do that anymore. You're just going to have 40 plus 15 plus 40 plus 40. You'll have all of that time for all three questions. Okay? So your test is a little bit longer than a lot of other AP tests. If you're, how many of you have taken more than one AP class? Okay, so you, this will probably be your longest uh, AP test because it's a little bit longer. So as you are reading your sources, one thing that you want to do is annotate, right? That's going to help you stay engaged with your text. How many of you start reading and then realize that did something happen, that your words evaporated and you started thinking about where you're going to go for lunch or wondering what the snack would be or uh, if you could go fishing this afternoon or, you know, what's going to happen in school next week. That happens all the time. So how are you going to avoid that? You want to stay engaged with the text. And what I like to say is have your pen or your pencil and just follow along with it. And I, and I say, you know, uh, I tell my students to block concrete things, you know, put squares around concrete things and circle abstract things, 
okay? Things that you can't touch, like hope and inspiration, all right? So with synthesis, the skill is basically taking from these sources that you're going to be given and backing up your thesis. That's what you're going to be doing, okay? Yes, sir? Um, are we going to actually be writing essays today or just learning about them? We, it depends on how far we get, okay? You make it to the point where you feel like we can. We are going to look at an actual prompt from the 2009 AP Lang test. So you're going to see the real deal, what it looks like. And we're going to go through and evaluate sources because that's what you're going to have to do. Now, the difference that we have today is we're going to be in here until um, 940. So... Uh, we're going to have an hour and 10 minutes to uh, do this. And when you actually get in to take your, your test, you're going to need to move a lot quicker than that. But, you know, with any skill, once you, when you start it, you're kind of slow, but you're going to get faster, okay? So by May, you'll be just zooming right along, okay? So let's look at what you've got in front of you. If you'll just open up your student packet with me for a minute, just open it up. Okay, I do want you to think about what thesis, uh, what synthesis is, and uh, it tells you it's a free response question that asks you, and you know that means you're going to be writing, that asks you to respond to an issue of current importance. Some past synthesis topics include environmentalism, education, memorialization, that was one on statues, yeah, and honor. You will be expected to construct an original argument about the issue by synthesizing the attached sources into an effective response. We're going to look through the sources in just a minute, but stay with me now. Um, the most important thing is to realize that you are generating an idea based on the prompt. You are generating an idea based on the prompt. That is huge, okay? You are generating that idea based on the prompt and then you're going to back it up with textual evidence. And when you use the textual evidence, you must document it. You must give credit to your sources. Okay? And we're going to look at the different ways that you can give credit to your sources. So have you guys gotten to this at all in your class yet? No? Well, my students haven't either. I mean, my goodness, it's September. Okay? So this will be like a little preview, and your teacher's going to come back and revisit this a lot. All right, so as we look at it, um, know that you're going to have that prompt, and then you're going to have all of the sources. I think this is uh, a great question because you've got something to look at. Even if you read the prompt and you think, wow, I don't know anything about that, it doesn't matter because you've got all of these sources. You've got a bunch, okay? So you're going to get to have plenty of time to uh, look through them, and annotate them today so that you can get used to that later on. And we'll work in some groups so you'll get to hear the ideas of others. So back to this. Uh, the format of the question. You're going to have a cover sheet that will include an overview and some background on the issue. Just give you a little uh, information and the prompt. Okay, it's going to give you your task. An assignment or task that serves as the writing prompt, tell you what you're supposed to do on this essay. And then expectations for how to construct the written response and a list of sources. And the sources themselves. How many sources? It varies. Between six and eight sources. A lot of times there are seven. Okay? Seven, but they don't say seven because they can go one up or one down. Uh, MLA citation at the top. Italicized background information on the source. Text from a range of publication including newspapers, magazines, political cartoons, images, charts, graphs, and more. And we'll look at that so you'll be able to see uh, what your different sources are going to be. So think of the cover sheet as an introduction to the discussion. The cover sheet's going to say, this is where we are, and here's where you're going. Without bias, it's not supposed to give you a slant, okay? It presents the issue and poses a question for debate. The sources provide a range of perspectives. So the sources aren't going to push you in one way or the other. Um, on most debatable issues, you can take this side or you can take this side. And you're going to have source material to back it up either way, okay, with all of these sources. 
So the sources provide a range of perspectives involved in the discussion. And I already told you about the time. So what you need to do is understand the issues background and the writing task. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to break down the task and talk about what's explicit, what's implicit, what you'll know you've got to do and what you've got to infer where it's implied. All right? Uh, you're going to read, evaluate, and annotate all the sources. That's what you have to do. When you go in to take that test, you're going to read those sources, and you're especially going to mark what you think you will use. Okay? But you're going to make notes. Because if you don't make notes, when you start trying to come back to look for things, <coughs> there's no control F on paper, is there? You guys use control F for find. So you can go in and find things in text. I do that all the time. Okay, life is short. Use control F. And you can give you a little box and you can search for things, but not on paper. So annotating is the way you're going to be able to go back and find things. And that's huge. All right, so on this assignment. You will have a rubric as you do on all of them. You must use at least three sources. I tell my students I want to see four sources. One to grow on, okay? So if you think you used three but you didn't, you've got an extra. But you must use at least three, so go for four, okay? Have a bonus. That's what I'm saying. You've got to have textual evidence from at least three sources. Now, you can directly or indirectly refer to these sources. If you directly refer, what punctuation mark are you going to use? Quotations. If you're taking a direct reference, you're going to use quotations. If it's an indirect reference, you don't have to use quotations. However, and this is huge, you have to cite on both, right? Because that's your intellectual property. If you go to an SGA meeting and you've got an idea for the theme for homecoming and everybody's like, no, nah, nah, nah. that's not it. So everybody leaves and then later you go in and somebody else gets up and says your idea and a few more kids have come in and they go, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Are, are you going to say, well, you know, she, she didn't quote me exactly, so that's okay that she took my idea, because it wasn't a quote. Are you going to say, wait, that was my idea. Are y'all okay? <laughs> you do some jumping jacks. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you just going to let her take your idea? <laughs> You're going to say, that was my idea. When you go back in, everybody say, you know what, that is kind of valid. That's a great idea. What, what happened when I said it? Right? So we want credit for our ideas, whether they're quoted word for word, verbatim, or whether they are implied, indirectly quoted, indirectly referred to, indirectly referenced. Okay, so look at the very last sentence on here. This is huge. Will somebody read that for me? I'm going to have to call on the guy whose shirt says nope, okay? Like, oh, you read this for me? Nope, okay? Uh, so, the last sentence there on page two. <laughs> read it out loud. It is most important to have the reading of sources to formulate your own or argument and support it with information from the text. Consider how the texts work together to build upon your understanding of the issue. Okay, that word, those two words work together. What do you notice about them? They're bolded. So it's not enough to just say, okay, I've got an idea. I see some textual evidence in these sources. It's works. You've also got to think about how the sources are working together to influence you. Okay? And we're going to look at that. All right, so first of all, what kind of sources can there be in the world? Let's look at different sources. I just showed you one source. What was it? Or our video was. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, anything that's on the internet can be a source. I showed you a video source, didn't I? You know, that's a visual. But it does help you see how new ideas come from old ideas, doesn't it? Have you ever seen that many sizes and shapes of cell phones? It's kind of boring now because they all are just rectangles, aren't they? And they used to be all different sizes, shapes, strange colors, all kinds of things. All right, 
Um, so the internet, we can have visual sources. Uh, what other source types can we have? Where would you go if you wanted to find out information about something? Wikipedia, okay? So Wikipedia is sort of an online encyclopedia, okay? I don't think they're going to give you anything from Wikipedia. Uh, they're going to give you things from some uh, print journals. And then, of course, a lot of print sources now have online versions, you know. Uh, my students look a lot at uh, The Atlantic, at uh, The New Yorker, at The New York Times. Um, and I hope those are some sources that, that you're looking at. And you don't have to, I mean, the New York Times is a magazine. I'm sorry, it's a newspaper. Okay, the New Yorker is a magazine. I shouldn't use things that are so close in that. So the New York Times is a newspaper. You actually have to have the actual newspaper out on your table getting inked all over your fingers to look at it. Where can you look at it? You can go on the internet. They do, uh, especially the New Yorker, which is a magazine. New York Times is a newspaper. New Yorker is a magazine. They have like some film on, on their website too, so that's pretty cool. Um, so look at the different source types that they give you here: print media, other media, and these are sort of uh, periodicals, aren't they? All of these things: newspapers, journals, uh, a book. It's not a periodical, but they they wouldn't give you a whole book. The sources are all going to be short. Okay. Uh, most of them will fit on a single page, almost always. Um, online media, now if they might give you a blog post, but of course it's going to be on a piece of paper, you understand? Um, and websites, they may give you like a screenshot from a website, but it would be on a piece of paper. So what do you need to think about when you're looking at these source types? Who's the readership for the text based on the source in which it was uh, published and how does where it where it is published add to or detract from its credibility? I mean, if it's published in the Washington Post, which is another thing we look at a lot, are we going to believe it? I, I mean, probably. They have fact checkers before anything goes to press. Uh, they've got a strong journalistic reputation that they want to protect. So if it comes from a reputable source. We're, we're probably going to believe it. What about the date? Does the date matter that it was published? Yes. Yes, it absolutely does matter. Now, as I told you, the question we're going to be looking at comes from 2009. So you got to keep that in mind. You're not going to see any sources in there from 2012 because, you know, it was only 2009. But still, if there are old sources, are they going to be less credible? You know, perhaps, I mean, if they're talking about some historical junk, uh, juncture, um, then maybe they're going to give us the valid insight, but that is something to keep an eye on, okay? Um, argument, you may have text that is uh, argumentative, uh, and you're going to look at the key phrases, the structures, the punctuation in the text that shows the author's argument explicitly. You're going to consider the text in its entirety. What is the author implying about the topic? I mean, when, when we write, we're persuaded. You know, all writing is, all rhetoric is persuasive. When you write something, you're trying to, unless it's expository, unless you're writing a lab report for school, okay, or answering questions, and even then sometimes, uh, if it's an essay question, you're trying to convince, persuade, right? So where is the writer trying to lead us? And that takes us back to the rhetorical triangle, right? We always have... Our presenter, our speaker, our writer, and then we have the audience. The original audience matters most. So if it was published in the Wall Street Journal, who was it intended for? Wall Street, Wall Street people, thank you. Uh, maybe people in finance and banking who would be Wall Street people, yes? Uh, if it's published in the New York Times, who's it intended for? You know, a, a lot of people live in New York. People all over the nation read it too. Uh, but I, a lot of it is going to be centered on New York. There's going to be a lot of national news in there too. Okay, But movers and shakers, people that want to be up with the times, know what's going on right now. Yes? Uh, one of the prompts uh, tells us, not the one we're looking at today, but another prompt tells us that something was published in a religious magazine. 
Well, that's intended for a very different original audience, isn't it? So we're always going to look at the speaker, the, the author, uh, the person making the speech, and we're going to look at their credentials. We're going to look at that original audience that it was intended for, and we're going to look at the purpose. How are they trying to move that original audience? And all of that is going to influence our opinion. Yes? Yes. All right. So, um, when it tells you to look at the author's purpose, why was the source created? Think about that. To inform. Maybe it's just information. But information sometimes will have a slant to it. To entertain. To persuade. To satirize. What a satire. It's what you make fun of. You're making fun of something. Have you ever looked at the onion? No, the onion is an online uh, magazine and they make fun of things all the time. Okay? So they might make fun of a, a tabloid. You know? Woman has eight headed baby while being kidnapped by aliens. Yes? That's obviously satire, right? Okay. And sometimes satire will be uh, overt, and sometimes it's harder to discern. So you have to be aware and looking for that. All right, and so bias. That's another thing we want to look at. And hopefully by looking at the speaker's credentials, looking at the diction, looking at so many things, we'll figure out whether it's bias. Is it overtly one-sided, you know? Uh, the piece that was in a religious magazine, I mean, it had an obvious slant. It was one-sided. Um, is it objective? Does it try to weigh things out? Look at the pros and cons. Make a yes-no list. Is it skewed? Does it examine the pros and cons, but it's illogical? It's not a fair treatment. That could happen. Consider how the author bias is conveyed in the text and how the author's points match challenge or build upon your own. Now, I do want you to look at these um, gray boxes. They say gray. Mine's kind of blue. I guess yours gray boxes. Uh, but we are going to look at the synthesis question cover page aloud. And then I'm going to let you, these gray boxes tell you what you're going to be doing. Okay? Uh, I'm going to let you work with a partner or a small group, and I've got some small groups in mind. Uh, and we are going to go around and do a source uh, carousel. You know what a carousel is, where you go round and round. And we are going to do that and look at the sources uh, with our groups. And we're going to look at the scoring guidelines and commentary and then come up with a revised thesis statement. So let's see what our question is today. I think this is a pretty provocative question. I think it provokes you to really think about an issue that has an everyday relevance for all of you. So I like this question. This came from uh, 2009, uh, Form B. I don't know if you what that is, uh, but let's look at the suggested time. 40 minutes. This question counts for one third of the total essay section score. You guys understand you're going to write three essays and then you're going to have some multiple choice, right? So this will be one of the three essays. The following prompt is based on the accompanying seven sources. This question requires you to synthesize a variety of sources into a coherent, well-written essay. When you synthesize sources, you refer to them to develop your position and cite them accurately. Your argument should be central. The sources should support this argument. Avoid merely summarizing sources. That's huge. So, Miss Alabama, with your Alabama shirt on right now. My daughter said Alabama first year. Not younger, not old dog. All right, Miss Alabama. What is your job? Is your job, this is a yes or no question. I'm going to start off 50 50 tree box. Is your job to summarize and report on what is in all of these sources? Is that your job? No. Congratulations. You are the winner of this round. 
okay? You win this round. Uh, that is not your job. Now, who can you tell me what is your job? Should we make this an Alabama Auburn thing? Should somebody from Auburn tell me what is your job? Uh, oh, I see you at East Harvard. Is that home? Oh. Y'all work together, you at Harvard. That's pretty powerful. All right. So, so tell me, what is your job? It's not summarizing. You've got all these sources, but you're not going to summarize. So what's your job? We better shed some light on it. We better shed some light on it. What's your job? Right. You're going to come up with your own argument by reading the sources, annotating, and thinking. So you're going to read and think critically. Okay? So, remember this. You have to give credit. That's the next sentence. Remember to attribute both direct and indirect references. So what punctuation are you going to use with the direct references? Quotation marks. What punctuation with the indirect references? Well, who knows, but not quotation marks. But you still have to give credit. How are you going to give credit? We'll get to that, okay? Let's look at the question. Who's a great reader wants to read the question, the prompt? Who said it? Oh, I said UAB, it's UAH. I like centralized you there. <laughs> Sorry. It's good. Okay. So, go ahead. Where is the question? It says introduction. Oh, okay. You said question. I'm okay. I'm sorry. Introduction. The introduction is really um, the background, okay? And then the assignment is really your prompt. So, introduction. Mass public schooling has traditionally proclaimed among its goals the following. One, to help each student gain personal fulfillment, and two, to help create good citizens. These two goals, one aimed at the betterment of individuals, and the other aimed at the betterment of society might seem at odds with another. At the very least, these two goals are a cause of much tension within schools at every level. Schools want students to be allowed or encouraged to think for themselves and pursue their own interests. But schools also believe that it is right in some circumstances to encourage conformity in order to socialize students. Interesting. Okay, so that's your introduction. Okay, Read the sources that follow, including the introductory information, carefully. Now, we just read the introductory information, but you might need to go back and read it again. Okay? Because we didn't annotate it. We didn't mark it. We didn't mark what's important. All right? Choose an issue. Choose an issue related to the tension in schools between individuality and conformity. They give you suggestions. You might choose an issue such as dress codes, mandatory classes, or the structure of the school day. You do not have to choose an issue that you have experienced personally. Then write an essay in which you use 